Well, hi. I'm really pleased to have another opportunity to talk with Darren McGee uh, today, who's a practicing psychotherapist in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and has a very popular YouTube channel titled by his name, Darren McGee. Uh, I suspect most of you are familiar with that his channel already. And, um, you know, if you, if you go to it, which I highly recommend, you'll see uh, the vast uh, breadth of topics Darren has extensive knowledge in, and I think has provided such a a, um, a benefit to those interested in the field of psychology um, and particularly in the field of uh, recovery from narcissistic abuse, uh, the various you know presentations of narcissistic behavior, the impacts that can have uh, for survivors of such treatment, and the uh, ways uh, people can have hope to kind of recover from these impacts um, in the course of therapy. And today we're going to talk about uh, our respective approaches to treating survivors of narcissistic abuse. Um, with that, Darren, I'll turn it over to you to say, say a little more. Again, that's quite an intro. <laughs> I hope I live up to it. Well deserved. And thanks for having me on your channel. I'm looking forward to um, chatting with you again. I enjoyed our chat last time. Um, yeah, I would work from an integrative model which means I would draw on different disciplines. It's it's the lecturer who taught me, that taught me the integrative model, I always remember him saying, it's never a one size fits all. Mm. So I, I've always bear that in mind. So, I mean, I would draw on things like the person-centered approach. I would use a little bit of cognitive behavioral therapy. I would draw on the psychodynamic approach. So they would be my, my core training, if you will. But since graduating, since practice, I've learned other approaches. I've been looking at the Gestalt approach. Um, I've been dabbling more recently in uh, DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. I would also use a lot, I'm a big fan of, um, drawing on a lot of the work of DeShazer, um, Steve DeShazer and Inso Kim in the solution-focused approach. There was just one line when I was reading about this, there was just one line that really, really resonated with me. The Shazer believed there are always exceptions. And he believed it is important to explore those exceptions. And that really resonated with me. So I would draw a lot of that. I would use um, quite a few solution focused um, methods, um, techniques in the therapy as well to try to help clients to recognize their, their strengths, strengths that maybe they have been for want of a better word, they've been gaslit into believing aren't strengths. They're actually weaknesses or there's something wrong or bad with them and so on. Again, it's 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 like anything, it's an ongoing journey. We'll always learn new approaches and new ways. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, can you offer a clinical example of uh like an exception you've identified in the client's narrative and how it's well, um, benefited? Um one of our unhelpful thinking habits i would call it is all or nothing thinking there is overgeneralizing. so people might say things like it's always this it's never that things like it never goes my way it never works out for me or i'm always the one at fault there are always exceptions there were times when even if it was before you met that person, or even if this, you know, is something historical, this is something we grew up with. There were times when we were able to manage, where we were able to come through. We were the bravest person in the room. We were able to say no that far, no further, and everybody heard it. Now, even if they are small, little, tiny moments, they are still exceptions. And it's mm -hmm. about exploring what was different in those moments, what was different yeah. in those relationships, even whenever people did value you, people did listen to you, people were interested in you. Uh, it's exploring those differences, looking at what the differences were and what can you bring into the present? What can you build on? Mm. That's great. Because um, I think like at least when I think of folks who survive narcissistic abuse, there can be like the thought of like what are the exceptions may uh arouse some trepidation of like wait you mean i got it wrong like i'm wrong i'm making a mountain out of a molehill or something of the mm. way like the narcissistic parent treated me but from the, you know what you're describing it actually sounds like it's 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 in the service of validation actually i mean all, the one the person's core self that they are an effective um 
valuable person. And it's there's some exceptional moments where that may be uh, reflected. But in the narrative and the beliefs that maybe have had to be adopted, that information is very hard to connect to. And it sounds like you're helping folks connect to these other instances that aren't on the track that typically is played. Yeah, yeah. It's um it's it's what's referred to, I believe, as self-gaslighting. It's if you will, mm-hmm. it's a dramatic way of putting it, but it's almost like brainwashing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, the time someone says no then they're bad for saying no they're they're supposed to give in they're supposed to give over they're supposed to succumb you know they're supposed to collaborate collude sometimes even with their own abuse no there are exceptions because it might not have been with that parent it might not have been with that partner but it might have been with a work colleague it might have been with someone else who was maybe trying to take advantage trying to exploit and there was that time when they they were if you will they were courageous they were brave they were confident and there was something different in that time Mm. and they might not have felt the same guilt that they felt in the presence of that abuser who's well you know with narcissism it's everybody else's fault it's mm-hmm. you know how dare you say no to me i'm entitled or something bad about you for saying no but there was something different in that time with that person in that situation it might not have felt comfortable they might have felt really uncomfortable they might have been nervous but there was something different because they didn't feel the same guilt they didn't feel the same shame and it's looking at what that difference is because sometimes it's not the person themselves it's the other person or the other situation or the other people that lead them to believe that they are bad that they are fault they are at fault yeah yeah that's powerful that's i think you're at least when i think of the crux of what recovery from narcissistic abuse entails and maybe even other forms of abuse is really like dis disentangling Mm. who the person is from who they've had to think of themselves to be Mm. uh to survive that type of like devaluing uh diminishing treatment by the narcissistic person who has authority at least for a period of time in the person's Mm. life yeah that uh that level of authority Again, with narcissism, we often see very controlling behavior. You can't control someone through dominance, through bullying, through things like that. You know, you maybe try to control them through through guilt tripping, through shaming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's two different things. Well, more than two, but two things you often get is my outrage and my anger proves how right I am, or mm-hmm. My pain and my misery proves how wrong you are. Two different ways of getting the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think even in the domineering case, there's often, um, they're offending from the victim position. So they've like offloaded the um, offense onto the victim. Mm -hmm. And it's because that victim treated the narcissistic person worthlessly that now they have our, our right to attack, implicitly treating the, yeah. the other victim like they're worthless, but that goes unacknowledged. It's it's the victim's, or the, well, the narcissistic abuse's victim's fault that they have to behave so badly towards them. Yeah, and it's it's something that comes up, and I wouldn't just say in therapy, it just, it, it comes up in, in general conversations with people, um, comes up on comments on the YouTube channel. I'm sure you get this as well. I'll paraphrase, sum it up and paraphrase it. The number of times people ended up apologizing for feeling the way they feel at how they're treated. Mm. Or how they've been treated. They ended up mm-hmm. actually, you know, feeling bad about feeling bad. Yeah. There's no room for that, you know, with a narcissistic uh, parent or partner. It often leads to, and this is something that comes up, I'm sure you've noticed this as well when, when you're working with people, the suppression of the feelings as if there's mm. something wrong or something bad for feeling and finding it difficult to sometimes articulate what they really feel or even having the courage to name how they really feel because those feelings, those experiences, get they get trodden on, if you will. They get devalued. Yeah. Big time. Mm. 
interested in your approach. You talk about the the control mastery approach, and that's something I know very little about. So I would be very keen to hear a bit more about about that that approach. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's um. I think control mastery theory is in a way um, like a supra model of how the process of therapy can unfold when it's hopefully working well. And it basically kind of boils down to four, some will say five, I'll, I'll call it four questions of what are the client's goals? And these tend to be like developmental kind of goals that um, had to be abandoned in the course of uh, uh, growing up with a narcissistic parent. Um, but what amongst the goals that had to be abandoned might the, might the uh, client be trying to work towards in this course of therapy? And then the second question is, what sorts of beliefs might they hold, um, often their unconscious beliefs, but maybe they're conscious, uh, which stand in the way of them achieving their goals right now? Uh, and then the third is, what are the kind of key traumas that they may have experienced with a narcissistic parent, um, which may have led to uh, adopting these beliefs in a way that was adaptive mm. when uh, they had to deal with those circumstances. And then the fourth is really like, how can we generate information in the session and hopefully between sessions uh, for the client that helps them disconfirm those beliefs today? Mm. So they, in essence, feel freer and safer to pursue the goals that they at one time had to abandon. Um, and, you know, I think generally speaking, growth in and of itself for a child threatens their sense that the narcissistic parent is willing to take care of them. Mm. And that sense that your parent is willing to take care of you is kind of first and foremost for a child. If it feels in jeopardy, everything needs to be marshaled psychologically, emotionally to try to convince the child that, no, the parent is willing to be there. Um, I think that's an important distinction from the parent just being there. Mm. The, the kid has to infer and kind of believe or have some faith that the parent wants to be there. And that's a high bar with a narcissistic parent because the, the lack of empathy, the exploit, exploitativeness um, to use the child for the parent's own emotional needs do not send the message that the that the parent, you know, wants to be there to take care of the child on the child's own terms. Um, so that's sort of as the models applied to the situation of narcissistic abuse for a child. Um, but the idea too is that as therapy unfolds, um, the they, they call it the patient's or the client's plan with a capital P. That um, if you're, if I'm, if I have a, the right understanding of those four questions, and then the ways I respond, the attitude I hold towards the client, um, will give me then information of whether I'm working in alignment with their plan or if I'm off. So, so if I'm, let's say, working with someone who says I want to feel uh, more at ease to assert myself at work. In my close relate and in my close relationships, and maybe we determine a, a a belief, and control mastery theory calls them pathogenic beliefs, and that belief is is like um, something like other people's needs are more important than my own. Mm -hmm. um, then, like when we're say uh, in the session, I'm going to try to be attuned to uh, instances of kind of complying with that belief and work to respond in ways that suggest that belief is not applicable in our working relationship together. So for example, if that person were to say, begin to ask me a lot about my life in, since we last met or show a lot of interest and invite me to really kind of share more, whatever it is, um, I might you know, politely try to shift it back to them with an F, I mean, with the point being not that like, hey, I don't want you to know anything about me, but more, this is your time and you deserve this time. Uh, and let's let's get down to that business. And I I remain intact if we do that. I'm not going to retaliate or feel taken from. Um, and the, the accrual of those kinds of um, exchanges under control mastery, the theory is that that lets the client know it's incrementally more safe to kind of act out of compliance with a belief like others' needs are more important. And as that happens, they get to kind of test those 
and relationships outside the therapy and the quality of life generally gets to improve. Yeah, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's at the core of, but it, it largely influences cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy, again, the, the lecturer who taught me, I always remember him saying he didn't believe CBT was an actual therapy. He believed it was a tool to use in therapy. Mm, yeah. yeah I mean, it's just a very interesting way of putting that, and I, and yeah. I would agree with him. When people expose themselves to the things they feel uncomfortable with in those small, little, measured ways, again, you think this is the crux of CBT, but all approaches, I think, have elements of this. When they expose themselves to the things they feel uncomfortable with in small, little, incremental, measurable ways, over a period of time, they start to become more confident. They start to become more comfortable. They start to, if you will, they become more courageous. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like we, what you're describing there. It definitely. And I would just like, I think it's implicit in what you're saying. In control mastery theory, at least, it would also say the quality of the relationship and which one is doing that plays a big role. So mm -hmm. like their sense that they're safe and even like the nervous system gaining a sense that I'm safe when I'm sitting down to talk with my therapist. And that may fluctuate based on one's history of this sort of trauma. But still, there is that kind of foundation. I think that can play a big mediating role in that incremental kind of gains you're describing because actually um, CBT is fully consonant with control mastery theory that like, you know, if someone, uh, it, it's a means to an end CBT, yeah. but if, if it works to get them to feel safer in pursuing their goals, that's great. Um, and the quality of the relationship is kind of what gets paid a lot of attention to kind of undergirding the types of interventions yeah and those little small incremental movements is another way of breaking down and challenging some of those unhelpful beliefs those deeply ingrained beliefs For now, sure. um, i mean i was saying this recently um on, on, on a video beliefs are either fact or feeling mm -hmm. now there's probably much more to it than that but i'll say they're either fact or feeling and sometimes those feelings may be based on facts, but they may be based on facts that are perhaps no longer true. For example, you're no longer 10 years of age. You do not have to be in by 8 p.m. You know, or right. you do not have to be in bed by night. So they're no longer true. They may be based on facts that were relevant to one situation, not necessarily relevant to this. This is maybe a different person, a different situation, a different environment. And you now have more experience. You have a bit more agency, a bit more autonomy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are based on things we have been led to believe. Now, to just try and pick apart someone's beliefs, you know, our defense mechanisms are automatically going to go up. But whenever we start to explore those beliefs and People do start doing those little things to, if you will, increase their comfort zone, to, to develop their, their, their uh, confidence. It's actually their own work. And, and if they're keeping notes, if they're keeping a diary, for example, or if they're measuring skills, it's their own handwritten evidence. Mm. There is something quite powerful in that when it's someone's yeah. own handwritten evidence. They're not just reading a leaflet, a book, a worksheet or something like that. What do you think in your approach and, and, and experience can make it hard uh, to kind of like take in that new information? Uh, you know, like you're saying, the facts were true at one point and not now. And yet there's a challenge there to kind of feel like uh, what's true is, in fact, true now. Well, um, I think there could be many things going on. Some people, for for instance... You might have someone who grew up in a narcissistic family, someone who perhaps, you know, a child who had to grow up too quickly. They had to look after the siblings, not even the narcissistic family, just a family where maybe the parents were emotionally absent or distant. You know, there could be, could have been an addiction, could have been an illness or something. But they, they, it's like they grew up too quickly. They're having to look after everybody. They're feeling a lot of responsibility. There could be, um, you know, there might have been a separation. So with the parent they're with, there might have been a bit of enmeshment. They start to be treated more like a partner 
you know, an mm-hmm. adult rather than a child. So there's a lot of that going on. And then by the time they get into adulthood, you know, again, it's an unconscious thing, but the partner they seek almost mirrors the parent. Mm. Not necessarily the parent they wanted or the parent they needed, but the parent they actually had. Even in the workplace, um, you know, everybody else is getting overtime. Everyone else is getting bonuses, and they're almost, as you said earlier, I, I paraphrase it, I everyone else is much more deserving than me. Mm-hmm. That's when it can become quite deeply ingrained. So, again, it's saying it out loud. It just it can feel like someone's being challenged, but again, this is where I would maybe draw on on Rogers, you know, Carl Rogers. Mm-hmm. He was a big believer in um, a phrase I once heard: encouraging clients to talk. The more I talk, the more I learn about myself. Mm-hmm. So the more they're telling their story, the more they're being heard, the more they're being listened to. Like they may be validated, not necessarily being affirmed. They're not being agreed with. But then, and not even overly challenging. But whenever they're saying things like that about how they believe this and they feel that, and the other person might react the other way, you know, doing a little exploring with intent, shall we say, mm-hmm. what does that actually mean? And what would happen again? Maybe drawn on a little bit of solution focus. What might a reasonable alternative be? What would it look like if people were okay with you putting your hand up and saying, "I would like that," or what would it look like if you were to say no? And the other person's just fine with it. It's just looking at different alternatives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's in the safety of a therapy room. So there's no one to criticize. There's no one to judge. There's no one. It just thinking about things in a slightly different approach. And even whatever is explored, then maybe looking at, well, what would it look like? Even just once, just once this week, if you could pick something and they might say, well, you know, whenever we're sitting in the staff room and this comes out and we're asking for whatever, instead of me jumping up straight away and volunteering to do someone else's work, no, I'm just going to sit and finish my coffee just to see what happens. Just Mm -hmm. trying one little thing and and paying attention to the outcome. That's really interesting because it it seems like, like in those examples, you're making some of these prior sort of strategies for avoiding danger Mm. and maybe singled out for not kind of like complying with someone else's entitlements. Mm. Almost it sounds like alien to your client. Like, you know, because by like such a subtle, I think, great example of like not raising your hand to do the Mm. volunteer, it, it seems like it can create in the client's mind a sense of, oh, I, that's not just something I do. I can think about this and choose yes or, or no. Choice. It's safe with Darren to consider that. Yeah. And there's, um, you, you might be familiar with it, there's uh, an approach, there's a, an exercise. It's, it comes from the Gestalt approach in therapy. They call it the empty chair model. Sometimes I've done this in the room. Sometimes I've just talked it over and maybe someone has done it themselves at home. But you just, you're, you're sitting in a chair and there's a chair opposite you. It's empty. And that mm-hmm. person that's maybe hurt you or is bullying you or treats you in a certain way, you have the conversation with them that maybe you need to have. Now, it takes a bit of imagination. And as I often say to people, it's not a spectator sport. You want, might want to make sure there's no one watching. You're talking to an empty chair. <laughs> But you're having the conversation with them you feel you need to have. You're telling them what you think. Tell them how you feel. You're telling them what you think might be in your best interest. You can even, you can imagine their responses as well. Now you pretty much know how they're going to respond. So even if they're telling you you're selfish or you should be doing this, that and the other, remember this is perfectly controlled. You're perfectly safe. This is your imagination. You can still stand your ground. Practice using what we call the broken record. Now that you just keep saying the same thing over and over again, mm. regardless of what comes up. Uh-huh. There's, there's lots of different ways to practice these little things. And I think a lot of the time, with regardless of what it is, but particularly in, in, in cases of uh, abusive, toxic relationships where people have been gaslit, brainwashed, and so on, these little exercises can be helpful just to 
practice a different mindset, to explore alternatives. Uh-huh. Yeah, and it seems too implicit that you're really on the client's side. Like you're, it sounds like finding, well, have an attitude that like they are a worthwhile, capable person. And mm-hmm. when you hear information to the contrary, it, you're sort of putting that in your like therapeutic crosshairs and collaborating with the client to see how that can be understood and challenged together. Yeah, and even looking at the same looking at the same thing slightly differently you know it's a, a form of reframing if somebody says no that means they're selfish that means they don't care mm. so maybe having a look at that from a slightly different angle what's the difference between caring about and caring for so the client's now starting to think a little differently you can care about someone it's not the same as trying to rescue them when and is typically like if they say saying no is selfish that that more applies to them mm. than they experience that as a, like others applying to others like yeah they're yeah. okay with being told no but it's yeah. not okay for them to say no mm. absolutely yeah it's it's funny that we're well, not funny funny in a peculiar way and then funny in a humorous way the number of people who have been through narcissistic abuse and so on find themselves you ever notice accused of the very things the abuser does mm-hmm. and whatever it is the abuser does is perfectly fine mm-hmm. but anything yeah. Anybody, isn't it? yeah know, and a little bit of psychoeducation you know you know sometimes we would refer to that as projection you know and all of a sudden the client now has a word for it now it doesn't mean they're going to go out and tell everybody you're projecting but they're a little more aware of it. Awareness is a very powerful thing, I think, because it always gives you a choice. Yeah, I, th- I would say too, sometimes it can get, uh, I think, more severe and convincing when it gets to, um, it, the narcissistic person is projecting, but then also acting in a way to influence the mm-hmm. victim to identify with the projection as though it's their own state. It was so kind of like pathological projective identification. And I found that concept to be, I mean, in it, in making it experientially relevant, but yeah, along the lines of creating awareness for the survivor, just mm-hmm. so important because when you, when you're, when that's constantly happening where the, where the narcissistic parents, I think own sense of worthlessness is intolerable and they cope by just insisting on the opposite that I am, um, worth more than others, they need to put it somewhere, which typically can be the scapegoat child. Um, this all happens unconsciously, so they're a hundred percent convicted that oh, the child is the worthless one, or X, Y, or Z. It doesn't really. I mean, it matters, but it also sort of doesn't matter. But the parent already knows this. The narcissistic parent already knows this. The child is found this way, and so the reality they're offered is you're less than me. Um, or I don't know who you are. We have no shared reality. Well, that's untenable for the child. Yeah. So the child, it's almost, I feel like, has to kind of accept this like alien within them that's really negative and, mm. you know, berating in order to just kind of sh- breathe the same psychological air as the parent. Um, and I think that this kind of neutralizing that kind of experience and with information and with repeated repeated relational experience that you're fine you know in in this and i'm not gonna like hoist something really nefarious onto you because i need to do that is just another you know important ingredient to this this process of recovery it is it's um that that inner critic that gets formed often you know, if people were to pay attention to the voice, now we all have an inner critic, by the way. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of healthy self doubt. We're not invincible. We don't know everything. But that inner critic, if people pay attention to it sometimes and they listen to it, it's actually, maybe it's not their voice, mm-hmm. someone else's. I think once people start to recognize that as well, it's sometimes a little easier to start to, if you will, to separate ourselves from it. Again, it's okay to have an inner critic 
warning us, telling us to be cautious or whatever. But that's not the same as the inner critic that tells us, why are you bothering? This is going to fail. Mm. You don't deserve this. Or even if something does work out, you just got lucky. You know, and I think... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I wondered how you kind of will lead clients to kind of do that, to do that close listening, uh, to see whose voice that really is. Because it, you know, like in my experience, that can be very, it can seem very much like the client's own mm. uh, voice. Well, it's, uh, again, it's it's looking at a, a sort of a gestalt thing. If you look at the, the gestalt method, how we look at how we hold things physically. Mm. Sometimes I'm just asking a client to just sit with that voice, sit with that uncomfortable moment, sit with that uncomfortable feeling. You know, something happened in work. They did really well, but they're, you know, they're, they're afraid they're going to get caught out. They're going to get, you know, like imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah I'll just ask them. You just sit, but hang out in that feeling. Pay attention to what it feels like, what comes up for you, and hear the voice, that, that inner dialogue telling you that you're going to get caught out. And as they're sitting with that, I'll just ask, um, what does it remind you of? When mm -hmm. have you felt like that before? What age do you feel? Whose voice do you hear? Just little different questions like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they might say it was a parent. They might say it was a teacher at school, a particular teacher. They might say it was an older sibling. They might say it was you know, a partner they had, even if it was a decade ago. But it's interesting the things that come up. Yeah. Just to be able to identify that. Right. And it sounds very powerful. Mm. And then again, it's it's how do we how do we unmesh ourselves from it? Now, this is the thing, talk about imposter syndrome. All of us feel like a fraud from time to time. We think we're going to get caught out from time to time. But when it becomes quite chronic, I think it is that inner critic. It is that voice of those in our past who have told us, you're not enough. You're not good enough. You don't deserve it. You just got lucky. And I won't know you any other way than yeah. that. Yeah. And, you know, whatever whatever it is, I think it's people finding it difficult to be able to accept their own qualities, their own strengths, to pay attention to their own achievements. And this is the thing about luck. Well, two things about luck. First of all, there is an expression. Do you ever notice the harder you work, the luckier you get? No, oh, yeah. So pay attention to that. But the second thing about luck is, even if luck was involved, you still had to play your part, even if it just meant turning up. You still had your part to play, so you still have a part to play in your own narrative, in your own success. Mm. Again, that I think that often comes from people. It could be the parent. Again, could be a partner, could be could be a previous workplace, you know, manager, work colleagues, whatever. The type of people who would rather you just looked at the floor and did nothing. Mm -hmm. Don't want you to achieve. Don't want you to even try. It's almost like you're a threat to them. Mm -hmm. Because, <clears throat> pardon me. Because there are some people, as I'm sure you're aware, they only feel good about themselves if they feel better than others. Yeah, I think I think a narcissistic yeah, person I would certainly qualify. Yeah. With the the narcissistic personality, again that threat of other people doing well, feeling happy, succeeding, even even just having a nice day. Yeah. There's that there's not part of them. That that sense of self is just so fragile. It's again, is it delusional or is it denial? I suppose there's maybe a bit of both. Everything they do is to protect that. Mm -hmm. Is to protect that fragile sense of self. Mm -hmm. And telling other people they either don't deserve, they're not good enough, whatever. Again, by the time they come to see me or you or whoever it is they're going to see. That has been so deeply ingrained that everything is about protecting that false sense of self of someone else. Which I suppose takes me back to the question earlier, the difference between caring about and caring for. We can care about people. 
but not necessarily responsible for them. Mm. You can care about even if it was your parent, even if it was the ex-partner, because don't forget there were good times. You know, even that employer that might have been horrible, they were still paying you a reasonable salary and so on. You can care about them. You don't have to hate them, but you don't have to care for them. They're not up to you to fix. Anymore. Yeah. Anymore is probably a better way of phrasing it. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, because like in the situation, you you if they have authority, I think the person is uh, responsible for to care for just in order to survive because mm. right the narcissistic person isn't doing it isn't making a request like they feel entitled to it and if yeah. if they if that entitlement is not complied with often like you said earlier rage or searing uh, 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 guilt mm. is delivered so to avoid those things you sort of have to I think during it mm. care for them yeah. but yeah and once we're out of that again looking in, in therapy some of the things we do to survive there's nothing wrong with things we do to survive in the sense that they get us through what we have have to get through but paying attention as to why someone thinks they still need to be employed i mean this is true of any kind of trauma when people get flashbacks and things like that it's all and people get triggered by certain things the belief being yesterday's threat is present today Mm -hmm. yesterday's situation is present today person feels as if they're right back there right and i suppose working in therapy as well what we're helping our clients do sometimes is to update their memories mm -hmm. finding different ways to update their memories mm -hmm. i think it's a process i control mastery theory would say it's the detection of safety versus danger that can very much mediate you know that process so um someone who you know had to care for emotionally speaking a, a narcissistic boss for, in, for instance or get literally get fired um who's now say it finally left the job and it can look back on that from a stance of safety may test we would call it control mastery theory in the therapy like um if you know, if I ask a question, but that's not what they want to talk about, is it okay if they say, well, I, I rather not answer that. I want to talk about this, you know, and how will I respond? Will I seem diminished? Will I, uh, you know, interpret, uh, do something psyche and say like, well, you're resistant or something weird like that, or just go follow their lead. And hopefully when the third thing happens, that becomes a piece of information that says it's safe for me to kind of take initiative yeah. here and you know in all these i think like almost unconscious ways i think those tests are performed and you know the the outcomes are registered to determine like am i in a new situation or is it just seem like a a new situation on the surface but it really is operating like things used to Ask, uh, you ask me the question a moment ago. I, I, I'd like to ask you from your perspective. You know, when you, um, you're you working with someone and some of these beliefs are quite deeply ingrained and sometimes we get resistance and it's a normal, healthy kind of, um, because maybe the person, as you say, maybe the person hasn't felt free to talk freely before. How do you, how do you work with that? How would, and from your approach, how would you um, support your clients to, to feel more comfortable to, to open up, shall we say? Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, control mastery theory kind of like puts the client kind of always in the center of things. So mm -hmm. if if it seems as though our, the treatment feels stuck or, um, yeah, in, in kind of ways you're describing, um, there's a, a guy named George Silvershots who's written and, and, and done a lot of research in control mastery theory who will say that in those moments, um, the question he'll always ask himself, which I totally uh, ascribe to, is what is this client working on in this moment? Mm. And so I might have the experience of, boy, it seems like, um, you know, I can't, the, the things I'm offering aren't being taken up or, and, and, that, and but I'll kind of ask myself, okay, let me just kind of wipe my slate clean and just think more about this client and more about those four questions. 
what did they come to treatment for? I take kind of a an, an uh, initial intake, so I often go back and look at what they wrote as their treatment goals uh, to just kind of help uh, reset things, and then think about the beliefs that they uh, in that intake. I ask them to endorse which of these sorts of interfering beliefs they have to wrestle with. Think about that. Um, think about the work we're doing, and usually when. Uh, when I kind of sit with that information and kind of take away maybe or, or suspend my initial sense of like, this is the direction we need to head in, it'll give me a clue that, oh, okay, maybe uh, this client's working on something a little more upstream for them. Yeah. And maybe I had like presumed that we're, you know, they were sort of further downstream, not like, mm. I, that sounds like they're, I think they're further along. I don't, I don't mean it that way, just in a different direction. Yeah. Um, and that usually pays dividends. Even if, even if I don't get it right, that like the client wants to move in this specific different direction. I think by suspending, trying to suspend my initial assumptions and trying to be more open uh, mm -hmm. to what they may be working on and need in that, in, in this phase of treatment it creates a space between us where new stuff can can happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it kind of varies client to client how that unfolds. Oh, that's true. If it's, if you will, if it's important, it will come up. Yeah. But it doesn't have to come up straight away. And one of the things I say to my clients when, when we're contracting, when we're having our first session, I will often say to them that sometimes I might ask you a question Sometimes I might want to, you know, look at a particular intervention or exercise you might find helpful. If you don't find it helpful, if you don't want to do it, just tell me. I won't be offended mm. because it's your process. It's not mine. What I will do, and I make it clear to them, I will, I will explain to you why I think it's useful to look at this or why I think you might find this helpful. But that's as far as we'll go. I mean, I will not be offended. You know, if you still want to focus on something else, it is your process. Mm -hmm. And I do that hoping that it does open up. It, do, it does open up the possibility that they they can say that. You know, some people might be very nervous. They might not. They, they might con consider me to be the expert. And I would very much think along the lines of Rogers. I'm not the expert. You are. You're the expert on you. You know. Yeah. Um, so it's just one way of encouraging that um, that confidence to be able to say to me, can we talk I, about this instead? Yeah, I think that's also antidotal uh, to the experience, again, of being with a narcissistic parent. Because mm. the attitude in those kinds of systems is often that the narcissistic parent knows you better than you know yourself. Yeah. And that that's even a point of pride, pseudo pride, for the narcissistic parent. So having to take care of that narcissistic person's fragile self would include in sort of like offering yourself up on a platter that like tell me the right decisions to make for myself tell me what i should be thinking and i think those get those kinds of uh expectations get tested a lot in you know therapy for recovery from this yeah. and the kinds of um stance you're describing taking and i think the ones i would also take the you know this control mastery theory serve to disconfirm those expectations which are insidious i mean it's almost like saying you had to kind of be taken over in your own judgment own psychology to kind of like do what was required yeah and again the the, the breaking away from that because a lot of people again the caring for as well as the caring about the caring for the thought of coming away from that, breaking away from that person, now, whether that's just going grey rock, whether that's just going no contact, whatever it is, that can bring up a lot of distress in and of itself. Oh, yeah. Um, and sometimes you, you'll hear it, maybe you'll hear this a lot, a lot of, do you know what, I've even said it myself, even just in conversations with people, we all say it at some level, I don't know what to do. And... Again, that's not an unreasonable perspective. We don't know what to do if it's something we're very unfamiliar with. And okay, I'm gonna admit you can see in the background here I've got a constitution class starship, so you know where my interests lie. 
Which There's a link. Oh. That Star Trek or Yeah, yeah. My okay. little, my little Starship Enterprise. There's a line in one of the movies um where Kirk and Spock are having this debate. They're arguing over what it is they're going to do. And of course the captain's plan is illogical naturally, you know. But his line is, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I only know what I can do. <laughs> And sometimes I will, you know, just remind clients of just little lines like that from a movie or a book or whatever. I don't know what to do. Okay, what can you do? Spock says that, or Kirk says Kirk it. Kirk says that. Kirk, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I do, you know, so I'll ask, what can you do? Because if we don't know what to do, sometimes we actually do know what to do, but what we know what to do is going to be painful. Mm -hmm. we're going to be met with wrath we're going to be met with rejection we're going to be met there's going to be some kind of punishment mm -hmm. so we start to explore the consequences of each one but also the pros of each one make a more informed decision what mm -hmm. we can't do unfortunately regardless of what we do in life sometimes we cannot always make the easiest choice Again, you think of survival tactics, survival strategies, especially maybe coming up in a home where you were responsible for everybody's misery. What we tend to do is the most expedient thing. It gets us out of that moment's distress. It helps us survive because we know we're stuck in that environment. So we tend to do the most expedient thing. Coming out of that environment or trying to break away from that environment break that enmeshment or whatever we still tend to think of what would be the least painful option the least painful option the most expedient option is not always necessarily the best one mm. so asking questions like well what can you do what are your options what would happen if you just left what happened if you stayed what would happen if this what would happen if you did that and exploring that, but again, both the pros and the cons. And recognizing that it doesn't matter what we do in life, whether we take a job or whether we don't take a job, whether we date someone or whether we don't, whether we stay or whether we leave, everything we do is going to have a consequence. Everything we don't do is going to have a consequence. So we explore those consequences. What might we thank ourselves for later on? Hmm. You will. We choose our consequences. It seems like uh, the way I'm sort of interpreting what you're describing the process is trying to slow things down and kind of holding, thinking like Indiana Jones with that when he's running from the boulder and then that that wall or whatever comes down, kind of holding up, not letting it close. So so definitively to say I got to do this or that really fast mm -hmm. to survive, and there's anxiety and yeah. it doesn't seem scary to hold it up and survey what what are the options. But that I suspect in therapy with you that might feel more tolerable mm -hmm. to consider those options. Yeah, we again it's just like when we expose ourselves to things we feel uncomfortable with we start to get a bit more confident a little more courageous and things like that the anxiety doesn't necessarily go away but what happens is it starts to dilute it starts to come down it's still there mm -hmm. but we maybe stop fearing the feeling the fear the feeling is there to inform us not necessarily make the decision for us so again by exploring what we think those consequences might be but remember, consequences don't always have to be negative. There can be a positive outcome. There can be positive consequences. Or there could be a short-term discomfort. But it's exploring those options and making the choice that might be in our best interest. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not even our own best interest, but the best interest of other people. Sometimes we're really not helping other people by continually giving them what they want. Mm -hmm. Jay, when you're working with people and you're working on recovery from um, difficult childhoods, toxic childhoods, narcissistic families and so on, even in relationships, what would you, what have you noticed would be maybe the biggest obstacles someone might face in their recovery? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, I actually, I think they can come in kind of three uh, forms. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, so I think of the, the process of therapy uh, recovery um, as kind of involving three components. And I think the challenges like conform to each of the components. So, so the three things are making sense of what happened to know it wasn't your fault, like narcissistic abuse. Um, gaining distance, whether psychological, emotional, sometimes physical distance from the narcissistic abuser. And then third, living in defiance of the narcissist rules. So I think challenges can be posed in each of those three dimensions. Like, um, you know, if, if someone is living in a currently narcissistically abusive system, it can be hard to make sense of that in a way that exonerates them uh, from responsibility because things are too uh, immediate. Like mm. the beliefs of feeling defective or undeserving need to be active to just kind of like get through what needs to be get through, gotten through, you know, yeah. the second they get out of session. Um, similarly, if someone's like has, is, say, in a narcissistically abusive relationship uh, while therapy's going on, um, I mean, that's not to say that that's a good reason to come to therapy, but it, it, um, that will become its own process of mm. getting to know that they can begin to challenge, you know, these beliefs and even the mandate that they care for the person who's being abusive, um, challenge it in order to separate from, get distance. Uh, yeah, that, that until, I mean, that becomes its own goal getting the distance that's needed because I think that, and I think there's good support that like, we know whether we're safe. Our bodies tell us whether we're safe mm -hmm. um, kind of unilaterally. Like I think of like Bessel van der Kolk's book, like the body keeps a score or um, Stephen Porges uh, uh, polyvagal theory, especially the polyvagal theory is saying, you know, we've got these three hierarchical uh, subsystems in our autonomic nervous system saying, at the base level, if we think we're under a uh, mortal threat, freeze, play dead. If we think we have a chance via mobilization, fight or flee. And third, if, the, if there's not a threat and there's like a socially engaging option, then respond in kind. Um, but if you're around a narcissistic abuser, then one of the first two systems is likely going to be operative, telling you you're not safe. Um, so getting yourself structuring your life where that sort of threat is less just present in a concrete way, mm. I think pays big dividends to your, to your own nervous system to be able to stand a chance to hear the safety signals from other people. Um, that's all to say too, that if you can't get that distance, it's hard to turn that danger siren off, um, because, because it's there, it's real. Um, the person's, and third, like to live in defiance of narcissist rules without those other two pieces in place of kind of getting some sense that what you were put through was not your fault. It was a reflection of the pathology of this person um, and to not have distance yet, I think makes it really hard to live in defiance to say not care for that person or not regard one's own needs as less important. Um, so, yeah, I guess I see like these kind of challenges being there, but if we kind of iteratively work um, in those three ways and the kind of accrual of experience, you know, hopefully in the therapeutic relationship gains more and more traction, a different frame of reference gets built, you know, one where they get to count, they get to, I would say, even exist in relationship to someone else. Um, and as that grows to feel more safe and like a healthy entitlement, um, gradually these challenges, I think, get to be worked through. Yeah, that again, they start to dilute the more familiar we become with something else. Yeah. I've noticed and this. This would be uh, across a long period of time. And I, again, this would come up a lot in comments and things. I'm sure you would find this maybe on your channel. The obstacles to recovering is the f is first of all, we don't like things that don't make sense. We we just can't process it. Yeah. 
we're probably the only creature on the planet that needs to understand things we don't understand. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to know what to do whenever we don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, we don't like things that don't make sense. In spite of all our best efforts, this still happened. They demanded this, they got it, it wasn't enough. And human beings, you know, we're not designed for... Um, we're not designed for stress and trauma and things like that. In spite of all the Bond movies you've watched, we're not good at jumping out of burning helicopters. We're not good with stress and trauma. But the biggest thing is other people's malice. Mm. We find it hard to comprehend other people's malice, their unkindness, their cruelty. And that often leads to things like rumination. And I think that's one of the obstacles when we cannot make sense of other people's behavior. The second thing I think is the need for some kind of justice. Now, whether that's revenge or something, justice might even just be in the sense of we need the other person to at least acknowledge they hurt me. Uh -huh. And they are never going to do it. Well, some yeah. might, that's a generalization to say they'll never do it. More often than not, they you know, narcissistic people are not going to do that. They're yeah. not going to give you the answer you want, even if they have it. Yeah. Because they still enjoy the supply they're getting from you coming looking for it. You yeah. know? So you're not going to get it. There is a need for some kind of justice. We need other people to see them as they really are. We need them to see them the way they really are. We need some kind of acknowledgement, some kind of apology, and that's not coming. And often that can keep people stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the last thing, and I've been reading up on this recently, and um, give me if I've pronounced his name wrong. Um, there's a guy, he has a channel as well, uh, Sam Vankman, if I got his name right. I'm some very vaguely familiar. Yeah. Um, and he's been looking at this as well, and he's he's been so I've, I've listened to some of his stuff, I've, I've read some of his stuff. But he's talking a lot about um, what we find hard when it comes to our recovery is it feels as if we're going to lose a part of ourselves. Now, he puts it in a very um, sort of dramatic way. He talks about it's like part of us has to commit suicide. Not necessarily. Um, but we feel as if we're going to lose part of us, that part of us that was enmeshed with them. Particularly mm -hmm. if you think parents, parents growing up. you know. Um, that need we have to be accepted, that part of us that's hardwired to feel significant to somebody. And the very people we were supposed to feel significant to are the people who hurt us. Which is why we're often ruminating and often thinking if I were to go back this time, would it be different? Because we find it very hard to let go of that part of us that is still maybe enmeshed somehow. Mm -hmm. They're just through, now I haven't, read more about that i wish i could go into it a bit more with you um but i think that's an interesting part of recovery why so many people get stuck why so many people you know even years after uh, an abusive relationship would still be ruminating over that person who hurt them so much not just because they can't make sense of it but because there's not part of them that is still hoping on some maybe unconscious level that someday they're going to be the version of them that they fell for yeah yeah, no, I, I totally agree on that second point of meeting the narcissistic person to validate the, the experience of the survivor it can be so compelling. And like you said, it can feed the supply of the narcissistic individual. There's a way in which, you know, I think when that happens, the survivor themselves is kind of not in the picture. It's all about the narcissistic person's reaction. Mm. what they will or won't do and it can be subtle but it again is a another way i think that um the narcissist gets to sort of be more important than the survivor but maybe to your point to be important to oneself is sort of well really for the narcissistic person to not exist mm. and there is a loss there because you can't be important and the narcissistic person be there like yeah that doesn't work they can't have both unfortunately yeah um, it's enough, so I, that's like not a normal 
situation, right? I mean, usually, sure, like there can be imperfections, there will be imperfections in relationships, but it's usually not so either or, like in, and you know, not even, even in um, other parent-child relationships that are somewhat strained, there still can be both parties there. But I think one of the features of a narcissistic uh, parent-child relationship is this kind of either orness either the parent is sort of there or the child is there and there's no parent mm. yeah there isn't what do you think about the ego there isn't room for both no 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 i think actually that can get to kind of the nub in some ways i think of the beliefs that have to get adopted there's something something like for the child, if I feel good, I will either be annihilated, abandoned, um, in essence, have nobody. I mean, it's so fundamental. And I think hard for folks outside such, such systems to grasp that that could be so, um, feel so forbidden. But it in fact is, there's no, right, there's no two people where the child survivor gets to feel good and coexist with somebody else. Yeah, and some people only feel good about themselves if they're feeling better than others. They can't yeah, you know that yeah. there's, there's the, this kind of skewed reality where you cannot feel good with someone mm-hmm. or for someone. Mm-hmm. It's it's you know, your your happiness is a threat to me. Yeah. That's, absolutely. That's, that's very unhealthy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you're born to someone like that, it's kind of what I find actually what I like one of the things I really like working with such folks is that, you know, maybe they were born to such a parent and had to kind of like go along with it to just get along again to survive. But they always seem to harbor like a different sensibility that like something like I'm okay, you're okay. Like, and they have found ways I think to preserve that and, you know, wait until they find a time and, and space and relationship where it can be safe to operate in the ways I think they're just naturally predisposed to. But that way of sort of, I get to be happy, so do you, and we can add to our happiness, just wouldn't fly uh, with a narcissistic parent. I think it's remarkable what they managed to to salvage through this type of experience. Yeah, and, and you know what? Let's take us back to, I mentioned to Shazza at the beginning, there are always exceptions. Because sometimes you have that child that grew up in a narcissistic family. Now that maybe they were made the scapegoat and they did what they had to do to survive. But they did not believe a word of it. As soon as they were old enough, they left home and they went off and did their own thing. There were even um, you know, in cases where someone was held accountable for other people's behavior, their moods and so on. And again, they do what they have to do to survive. But they recognize, you know, maybe it's uh, maybe they're being pragmatic, but they're in that, that workplace. And, you know, everyone else or someone else is maybe taking credit for their work. They're getting their bonuses. They're being blamed for this, that and the other. And it doesn't matter what they do, because even maybe they've went to good old human resources. There's nothing they can do, you know, whatever. It could be, you know, one company where everybody's kind of like that but they still turn up at nine o'clock every day. They do what they're paid to do to the best of their ability. And what the people who are maybe bullying them and so on, what they're not realizing is each and every time, what they're doing is they're building up their CV. What they're doing is they're building up their experience. And what they're doing is they're contacting other people. And then they're just one day out of the blue. I'm off now, okay. What do you need, a week's notice, a month's notice, whatever? They haven't been ground down, so they've been more pragmatic. Maybe they've learned a bit more resilience. So as I say, there are always exceptions. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Darren, uh, for coming on today. I really enjoyed getting to learn more about your approach uh, to working with survivors of narcissistic abuse. Um, It's definitely informed my thinking. And... um, I've enjoyed sharing with you some about control mastery theory as well. Um, and I've thanks learned for... a lot myself. I appreciate that. Oh, good. Good. Well, um, yeah, uh, check out Darren's channel. Uh, I think you'll be really uh, pleased with what you find there. It's got great content. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Take care. Thank-
And thanks again for having me on. And again, let's do this again. I do enjoy chatting with you. Absolutely. Take care. And you.